There is no stopping Rebecca Kwong. With the Poppy War trilogy already under her belt and the fantastic success of Waterstone's Book of the Year nominee Babel, she has reinvented herself once again this year with Yellowface, a literary thriller that satirises the very industry she's involved in, publishing and bookselling. As someone who has worked in both of those industries myself, not to mention the world of social media for the last 15 years, I couldn't wait to read this one, and was even more excited to sit down and talk with Rebecca about her approach to writing, her insights from the industry, and where she might take readers next. I want to know, I'm trying to work out what makes you tick as a writer, because you have been through lots of different... Uh, genres, I suppose you might call it. Um, you've, your writing has taken you to sort of several different places already, and I think you're only 26, is that right? Turning 27 in May. 27 in May. Okay, so about to turn 27, but you have already written um, what might be termed fantasy, uh, dark academia, and now we have a sort of psychological satire. Um, why, or I suppose, yeah, why did you want to write Yellow Face? And can you tell me a little bit about what sort of excites you as a writer and why it takes you to these different places? Well, frankly, I just love trying on new voices. Um, I have never wanted to be tied to any one genre or really any one series. And I think it's because my first three books were part of an epic fantasy trilogy. And that was five years in the same world with the same characters working in the same plot lines during a period of your life. Well, any five year span in your life is is a very long time. But I think particularly between the ages of 19 and 24, when you're graduating college and figuring out who you are, what kind of space you want to take up in the world, all these questions of personal identity, it's really hard to be locked to one thing during a period of immense personal change and growth. So by the time I got out on the other end and finished The Burning God, which is the third book in the Poppy War trilogy, I thought, I'm never doing that again. No more <laughs> series, no, certainly no more trilogies. I, I love the freedom that standalones give you to completely reinvent not just your work and your characters and the plots you're working on, but really your identity identity as a writer. And I mean, some of my favorite writers write the same kind of books for their entire lifetimes. I think Agatha Christie only ever read, wrote murder mysteries. Um, and, And that's great, but that feels like creative death for me. There's just so, so many different genres and styles that I want to explore. So I really, I first realized that I have this tendency after I finished up the popular trilogy and thought, well, I, I can't do that again. I'm completely sick of secondary world epic fantasy what what is something that is as different from that as possible and then it turned out writing like dickens was how i wanted to spend the next two years so i spent a while steeping myself in the world of the victorians and their run-on sentences and their very maximalist ways of describing the world had a lot of fun with that And then I grew sick of the Victorians and thought, well, what's another gear change I can make? And it seemed that the voice of the contemporary thriller, which is so different, it's so sloppy and raw and fast paced compared to the very temperate precision of of the Victorians. I thought that would be such a fun voice to try on for a bit. And that's how we got yellow face. So that's really interesting. So it was sort of the idea of, as you say, that sort of change of pace and the change of voice that made you want to write this kind of book. Um, But I suppose I'm intrigued to know why you wanted to write what amounts to a a biting satire of the whole publishing industry. I mean, uh, one might worry that you'd had a horrible experience of publishing over the last few years with some of the stuff that's in here. But tell me a little bit about why you felt publishing was so ripe for that kind of satirizing. Well, I have had some horrible experiences in publishing. I've also had wonderful experiences in publishing, and I've kind of seen both sides. I've lived Athena's life, and I've also lived June's life, which lets me reach the emotional range that I do in the text. But as for why it was a right time to write that book, 
I started drafting Yellow Face in mid-2021, and I don't know what things are like in the UK, but certainly in American publishing circles, 2020, especially late 2020, was a big watershed moment for the industry. Mm. It was a period where people were reading more, first of all, but people were talking online a lot more because nobody was going to conferences, all the major book events had been shut down, and everyone was going a little stir-crazy, and you saw conversation after conversation about everything that was messed up about the industry, what needed to change, particularly after the murder of George Floyd and protests across the US. There were lots of conversations about how is publishing failing authors who are not white. And there are all these proposed changes, all these campaigns. Publishing Paid Me took off, which was a campaign to compare the size of advances across different demographics. And it became clear there were some very bad structural inequalities within publishing that the pandemic had exacerbated, but also illuminated. So all of those conversations were swirling around me. And I end up writing about whatever questions are bothering me so much they keep me up at night so when my subconscious plopped the the idea the the twist that kicks off the novel which is one writer steals the manuscript of another and passes it off as her own I thought well I can't say no to that idea (laughs) it's really interesting you say that because I I remember that period at the time as you say sort of after 2020 where there was this quite um intense I guess, soul searching, if you like, within the industry, you know, what could we be doing better? And, you know, at one point in Yellow Face, um, the the phrase sort of token diversity pick is used. This is where June is sort of um, talking about sort of, I guess, capitalising on that energy. And, And do you think that publishing, for the most part, had its heart in the right place, like it was genuinely trying to change? Or does it remain, I suppose, always a model of business? And therefore, if that's what people want to read right now, that's what we'll kind of go for. I think the people up top at all publishers are always only going to care about the bottom line. There are so many fantastic people in publishing, booksellers, editors, publicists who do have their hearts in the right place. And I mean, nobody does those jobs for the money. They're doing it for the love of the story and love for their authors. And there are so many people who want to get, let's just say different types of voices, voices that historically haven't had platforms out there to readers. The problem is that there's this perception that only certain kinds of stories sell. I've been told in the US that if you really want to be a bestseller, then you need to cater to a Southern white lady book club. Um, And it's just like the very frank uh, sales breakdown of the demographics you need to hit. But I think publishing also underestimates those readers. I mean, we see books take off all the time that weren't anticipated to be bestsellers. And I think it's because it proves that readers are also hungry for experiences outside of their own. Even white readers don't just want to read books about white characters. So there's this ongoing dismissal of marginalized voices and I think an underestimation of the kind of range that readers are capable of and hungry for and and that all has to change. That's really really interesting yeah I mean um, there's a line in in the book at one point where uh, somebody says once you're writing for the market it doesn't matter what stories are burning inside you. This idea that once you've been sort of captured by a publisher and you've had a success that you just have to keep regurgitating that book again and again and again. It doesn't matter what you want to write. Presumably you don't feel that because you've been able to make these really deft changes in voice and and tell the stories you want to tell. I can't think about the market when I'm drafting. (laughs) And I've also realized an important thing about the market, which is that, well, first of all, nobody understands what the market wants. And the danger is when people have very rigid ideas of how you write to the market. But secondly, before Babel came out, I was terrified that it was going to tank because we had all these internal conversations about who on earth is going to want to read pages and pages of basically fictional etymology lectures. And it turned out many people are very (laughs) excited about reading etymology lectures. So I used to worry that my stuff was too dry or or not exciting enough, not sexy enough for readers. Um, But 
it turns out actually that there are many, many nerdy readers who are willing me to f- willing to follow me down any sorts of rabbit holes. So now I've learned to just be bold about jumping down those rabbit holes. Um, all that matters to me is that I'm writing about something that excites me, that I think is an interesting puzzle that confuses me. And if if the passion is there on my side, then that is going to resonate in at least one other person. Um, I want to sort of... Uh talk a little bit about I suppose what is the the driver of this book uh, or one of the drivers of it which is this idea of of jealousy uh, in particular the the jealousy that writers feel Um, again I'm gonna just pull a little quote from the book um, where somebody says jealousy to writers feels more like fear can you tell me a little bit more about that and what that means from from your perspective as a writer I yeah I think about envy and particularly female envy so much. Um, That is certainly a central theme of the book, but I'm also trying to theorize how this becomes a critical part of the voice of contemporary thrillers. I'm working on a piece right now and I'm still trying to pin down all my thoughts together. But if you look at a lot of the literary thrillers that have really taken off over the last few years and and particularly the ones that have film adaptations, which often use the the voiceover device of of reading lines from the book to, to situate us and tell us what's going on. There's this voice that comes up over and over again, this kind of snarky, sarcastic, dismissive female voice that that is very envious of other women, um, that loves to insult other women and and to drag them down to to make themselves feel better. And I think this is deliberate. So I'm reading this wonderful monograph by a scholar named C.N. Nye called Ugly Feelings, and she's theorizing about affect of envy and jealousy, all those minor, ugly feelings that are not quite as noble as as the the grand feelings of rage and passion and, and sacrifice that that makes for classic stories and she's wondering you know what's going on with this ugly minor affect and she wonders if we have underestimated envy as a way to figure relationships between women and if in, in ascribing envy to women, we're too quick to dismiss it as, oh, petty female uh, grudges and, and women just sniping at each other. You know, what else can envy illuminate? What structurally about who's privileged, who's not? What about class? What about race? Can writing through the lens of envy allow us? So I'm still twirling around with that. I'm not sure what my argument wants to be yet, but, but I do think about it all the time. Um, and I also obviously have many, many personal experiences with envy that I was able to draw on in writing this text because certainly during the first, I'd say two or three years of my career, I was very insecure. I think a lot of writers are very insecure and I think it's hard to watch other people succeeding, other people becoming overnight bestsellers or getting seven figure deals or to see other people getting all the things that you want for your own career and for whatever reason you're not getting. And there is that green, sour, vinegary envy that I feel when I see others doing better than me. But I think in an industry like this one, a lot of it is terror because it's a terror that we will never get a chance like that, that our careers are over, that this will be the last book we ever write, that our stories will never be accepted, that proof of somebody else's success really only highlights our own failures. And I think a lot of writers think this way. I used to get this, I would get this adrenaline boost when I saw a deal announcement for somebody else, even writers I like, writers I respect, if I see them doing well, somehow it would make me feel like I was failing. And and since then, I've gotten to a much healthier place about how I, I deal with envy. And I think some amount of jealousy can be good. It can inspire you. It can drive you to work harder. But this constant comparison to other people's careers has kind of gone away from me because I realized there there is no one career template. There are no set milestones that everybody has to hit at all has to happen at your own schedule. But I think we should talk more openly about envy. Jealousy is is a fine thing to acknowledge, and I don't think it's a it's a fatal flaw. It's what you do with that jealousy that matters. That's really interesting. So so that as you say, rather than uh, allowing it to kind of drag you down, you could use that as the spur for you to 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 go on and create more and to create better. 
Oh, yes. It's it's dangerous when you turn that jealousy into animosity towards other people. Mm. But when I see my friends succeeding, it encourages me and it wants me to work harder to match them. I think that's a healthy outlet for jealousy. That's really interesting because I've, I've spoken to a few authors, and I have to say in both cases, female authors who had said something similar, which was that when they read books that they just thought were incredible, that it, it gave there was a brief moment where they went, well, might as well just stop writing now because I can't I can't do anything as good as that. And then that kind of creative spurt would come again where they were like, but then I just have to try harder. I just have to work harder at what I'm doing. And then I can maybe achieve something like that. Whereas male authors, <laughs> and I don't, it's interesting what you were talking about the sort of the gendered response there to jealousy, because male authors tend to do that thing where they just kind of go, well, I just don't think that one's any good. And I think I'm better than them. And it's sort of about as simple as it gets, really, in that kind of um, thinking about other writers. Um, do, is it gendered? Um, I, I'm really intrigued by that from, from what you were mentioning earlier. Oh, I don't know if there is a particular gendered response to other people's success. I'm always very hesitant to make arguments that essentialize gender at all. But in terms of female envy, my argument is more about the way that that's been represented and Mm. talked about and and theorized. And there is an ongoing narrative in, in a lot of thrillers. Again, I keep coming back to what tropes are recurrent in a thriller genre where where envy between women, grudges, animosity, hatred, and and that particular intersection of love and hatred, all of this is portrayed as petty and feminine and hysterical and jealous. And I'm wondering if we can sit with that envy instead and and look at something that's going on on a deeper level in these relationships instead of discarding it as a quote-unquote female problem. Mm. Um, One of the other things that I think comes across so brilliantly in this book is... Um, how writing is such a solitary activity. So that uh, feeling of of fear, as you say, um, as the the sort of the expression of jealousy, um, definitely comes about when you're having to deal with things on your own because you're essentially working on your own. And it also comes to the fore later when a writer starts to feel threatened by by the outside world, by the, the mob that's out there. Can you tell me a little bit about writing as a solitary activity and and how you deal with that? I think there are many wonderful things you can get from a community of writers, certainly sharing information about advances and contracts, comparing what we know about agents, publishers. I think that kind of solidarity is important. It's important to have friends who are cheering you on at every stage of your career, friends that you can travel to Marseille and do a writing retreat with, which I did in January with some good friends. So I... I don't feel like I'm solitary in my career. I have a wonderful support system, but I also am am quite convinced that at the end of the day, writing has to be a solitary activity. There is a big difference between talking about writing on social media and being with community in that way and, and sitting down and just getting the work done. And I think you really do need to shut out the world and you have to shut out other voices and, and just focus on the words on the page I really love John Banville's work, and there was a while where I was reading every interview I could find that he'd done, and in one, he recounted a story where a young writer comes up to him and asks for his advice. Um, You know, I'm starting out, what should I do? What would you recommend? And he just tells him, well, the the most important lesson you'll ever learn is that you are completely alone in this. And, you know, obviously some caveats to that. Um, There is value in having community and people to vent to, but at the end of the day, it's just just you and the page and you have to learn how to be alone. I mean that presumably requires a huge amount of discipline and I wonder whether because as an academic you must have to have that discipline must have been instilled in you um, certainly it would appear to be by the, the, the pure achievements that you've managed to you know get uh, on your list by the age of as, as we said just about to turn 27. H- how do you maintain that discipline or has it just sort of always been part of your working practice? My friends often tell me that they can't just decide they want to get a task done and sit down and do it. And I've always been able to do this. I also recently bought a a 30 minute hourglass and that's been wonderful. It's nice to watch the sand trickling. It's nice to know when there's very little sand left. So I'm about to be able to stand up and have a break. Um, But I don't have a very hard time with discipline or whiling away the hours singularly focused on one task. And I think I'm just lucky that way. 
Um, I want to move on to social media now. As I said, this is an area that I've I've sort of lived in for a long time and worked in for a long time as well. And your depiction of, I suppose, what has happened to social media, I think, relatively recently um, is absolutely brilliant. And it's terrifying because there's this idea that uh, somebody's reputation can be entirely built online and then it can be entirely destroyed online and that those things can happen very very quickly in in either case um can you tell me a little bit about your experiences of of social media personally is it something that you use and enjoy using and what is it about that environment that you wanted to write about in yellowface oh i love being on social media i have a lot of fun on twitter and instagram and sharing the horrific results of um, half-baked baking recipes. <laughs> but I think the reason why I've been able to make social media work for me and mostly treat it as a healthy space is because I had mentors who were giving me advice when I was coming up in the industry about how to draw very firm boundaries around myself and what I'm willing to talk about. So I have set hours of the day where I'm willing to go online and I'm good about putting my phone down and stepping away from it, touching some grass, as it were, and, and focusing on, on the real world around me. And I also refuse to have very personal conversations or very difficult, nuanced conversations on platforms like Twitter, where I think it's basically impossible to have those conversations now. For that, I just have to pick up a phone and call a friend. I think there was a, a very brief golden age of publishing social media where it did genuinely feel like a fun water cooler environment where you could chat with other authors and trade book recommendations and talk about craft and meet agents and talk to publishers. And I think I caught the very tail end of that back in 2017, 2018. But that period, if it ever was as rosy and harmonious as I'm remembering it, I think it ended very quickly. And it's because these platforms are designed to polarize you and make you pay attention to hot button topics and scandal and controversy, you find that every time some kind of criticism of somebody or an institution pops up, even if it's fair criticism, very quickly, the conversation devolves to name calling and very extreme stances, outright canceling of people, often people who made a mistake that you should just be able to apologize for and move on. I think we're very bad as a community at talking through harm and reparations and apologies. There is a need for accountability and to, to be able to talk openly about bad behavior. But there is also this very quick move to shame and castigate and, and denounce people that is not coming from a place of care, but from a place of gleeful schadenfreude or just wanting to keep stirring the pot for entertainment. And you see, this is the discursive pattern that every kind of publishing scandal kind of follows. First, there's a fair complaint, and then there's a reasonable, interesting, and nuanced discussion about what to do about it. But then at the end, very quickly, it's just, it's just mudslinging and ad hominems. And, and then when the dust settles, nothing really materially has changed. So I find that very discouraging. I try to stay as far away from it as I can. I think that's probably very wise. I mean, I I, I do remember what feels like a golden age because I started using social media back in 2009, I think. And that's when I was, uh, I wasn't working in publishing then. I was, uh, I was part of, I suppose, that online book community. I was just somebody who loved books, wanted to review them and share my thoughts with other people and discovered loads of people who wanted to do the same thing, this community that was out there at the very beginnings, I suppose, of social media. And it was supportive and interesting. And I got to read some amazing books that I would never have found otherwise. And um, it's really a, a bit of a shame to see how that environment has changed. Um, as you say, it, it follows a pattern and has become incredibly censorious now as, as a place. So it's, you can't really discuss anything without fear of saying the wrong thing. And, and as you say, being cancelled. You were saying earlier about how you had used the support that exists on social media to have contact with other authors in order to, I suppose, open up the discussion around the industry so that it has been a bit of a closed shop, I suppose, in the past publishing. And so that opaqueness where people don't know what advance people have been getting, how much they're getting paid, what their rates are, how much agents are taking and all the rest of it 
it's really interesting to me that you have used the space and the support of other authors to, I guess, democratize that information, to share it, so that that would presumably give authors themselves more power in those conversations and maybe level that playing field a bit more for those who are looking to get into the industry. Would that would that be a fair assessment? Yeah, I think that transparency is critical and we should do more of it. But I can't take the credit for that democratizing. <laughs> um, there are two Black authors uh, who started the movement publishing Paid Me in 2020. And I think that was really the, the thing that got the snowball rolling because the disparities and advances that were being shared were, were shocking. You had white debut authors whose books went on to flop who were getting close to seven-figure deals for those books, completely untested writers. And then you had Black writers with a proven track record of hitting the bestsellers list over and over again, writing these award-winning award nominated books and and they were getting you know fractions of that and and people are asking why why is this happening and it was also very useful bargaining information to take into negotiations and to, and to use as leverage to say we know you have this kind of budget we know this is the the pot of money you're playing with and i think our authors deserve better so that information i think has helped everyone but beyond that just opening up the the industry and sharing conversations about for example, how you communicate with your agent. Some people are treated horribly by agents who should not be in the industry. Agents who don't return their emails, who are not advocating for them, who are not respecting them as clients. And, and they think that's normal because they don't have another case to compare it to. But now we have all sorts of podcasts and blog posts and online discussions where people are saying, this is how I talk to my agent. This is what I think is fair in a relationship. Here are red flags that you ought to look out for. And I think that's been really helpful. Hmm. And of course, um, as anybody who sees the title of this book, Yellowface, will, will, will guess that the issue, I suppose, of, of race is absolutely uh, central to it. And in particular, the idea of, of somebody uh, taking somebody else's story uh, and uh, passing it off as their own. And I wonder whether that raises this question about who gets to tell um, stories. It's it's something that June has to deal with as part of publishing the novel in the book and, and uh, having to say that she has done the research, if you like, to be able to tell this story. And I wonder whether um, this is something that you, you sort of obviously th have thought about. And I wonder how you feel about whether there should be rules, if you like, or decisions that are made about who gets to tell a story or whether it is simply that if you put in the work, anybody should be able to write about anything. The short answer is no. I am very suspicious of any set of rules, whether those are official or just community guidelines about who gets to tell what kind of story, which might surprise you because the practice that the title is referring to, yellow face, this practice of usually white actors donning makeup and costumes to, to pass off as Asian, it's, it's a very pejorative term for or for a practice that I think is harmful. But I think that anybody should be able to write anything. The The whole point of, of writing fiction is to be able to think outside of your own lived experience, to empathize with others, to to put yourself in somebody else's shoes. And and if we didn't have that kind of freedom to imagine and, and relate to, to those who are not like us, then all that any of us could ever do is write autobiographies. And I don't think we want that. So when we start having conversations about cultural appropriation and yellow face and who gets to write what, I think it's well-intentioned language that is going in the wrong direction. Because when you start putting limits on what somebody's background means they, they get to talk about, this more often backfires and I think hurts marginalized writers more than it, it creates space for them. Because instead you, you get norms that for instance, Chinese American writers or immigrant writers should stay in their lane and, and only get to write about immigrant trauma or Chinese stories. And that's an expectation that I've rubbed up against and um, rankled against. Um, and I think really the question is not who's allowed to write what, but who's getting the opportunities. So when people are upset about a book like An American Dirt, which is by a white writer, about Mexican immigrants trying to cross the border, the problem is not 
just that she's writing a story outside of her personal experience, but that she's getting so much ex- money for this, publishing attention, marketing, um, when there are so many other Latinx authors who can't get their foot in the door through publishing. So I think really we should be having conversations about whose voices are being uplifted, who's getting the chance to tell those stories, what kind of faces are in the room. I think another aspect of this is there is grounds for fair critique of of writing about experiences other than your own done badly. And, Mm. And that's what the conversation should be about, not you're white, are you allowed to talk about this at all, but you're white, you wrote this story, what did you do with it? Is it interesting? Did you do the research? How are you situating yourself against the community? What kind of tropes are you working with? Are you just replicating harmful stereotypes of the past? Or are you looking at this material in an interesting way that adds to the conversation? And these are questions about craft and literary value and and the story itself, which, which is all fair grounds for criticism. But when you frame it in terms of you can can't write this because you're white. That is so reductive and mm. I think a, a very bad standard to apply to literature. Um, just to finish off, you obviously are continuing in your academic career and developing what you're doing there. Um, but I know that you obviously are, you have another book in the works, um, which we know a little bit about. Um, but I, I wonder whether that drive to write is is still really, really strong in you and how it competes with your academic work. Do you, do you see yourself continuing to do both? I can't help but write. I <laughs> will always have to write. I have to slow down right now because PhD work is getting a bit harder. I actually asked for 2024 off because I was supposed to have a fantasy novel come out next year, but I think everybody was ready for a break. My age is <laughs> on maternity leave, my editor's on paternity leave, and everyone was very happy to say, okay, let's um, hit the brakes for, for a year and come back in 2025. Um, I'm also getting married next year. I'm taking my qualifying exams next year. I need to submit my prospectus next year. So I used to think I could do everything everywhere all at once, but now I'm realizing I have to pace myself, but there will be many more books from me. Well, this is very good to hear, but also congratulations on your impending marriage. Thank you. I'm so excited. (laughs) <laughs> well I hope all that goes well and obviously we wish all the best uh, for Yellowface um, and, and the book that follows it but um, I, you know I just can't thank you enough Rebecca it's so fascinating to speak to you uh, about this book and about your practice in general um, you give such fantastic thoughtful answers so thank you so much thank you for having me Yellowface is out now with an exclusive sprayed edge edition available from Waterstones Waterstones